Hey guys, don't forget the 2023 Street Cop Training Conference, Nashville, Tennessee, April 23rd through the 28th. You do not want to miss this so far. Guest speakers, Rob O'Neill, the Navy SEAL that was responsible for killing Osama bin Laden, Kyle Carpenter, U.S. Marine, Medal of Honor recipient, jumping on an IED to protect his platoon. Fox News host Tommy Lahren returns for 2023. Sheriff Wayne Ivey, Sheriff Mark Lamb, Sheriff David Clark, and more to come. You don't want to miss this event. We additionally have 20 of the country's top law enforcement educators giving you the best experience of your life. You will leave this event knowing more about your job and how to be proficient at the things you do hands down in any other event that you'll ever attend. I personally guarantee it. Don't miss out. There's a room code at streetcop.com for our room block and room code at the Gaylord at Opry is where the event's taking place. Don't miss out on a discounted rate. The rate is from Sunday to Thursday. Put that in and find yourselves at a half price room. Split it with a friend, but make sure you get there. You don't want to miss this event. It is going to be that good. If you trust me and you trust Street Cop, trust that you will leave there feeling like you've had an experience of a lifetime. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. Today I have with me one of my first companions in this journey. And interestingly enough, how I met him, it's a good story. I think we've talked about it before, but none other than your Pennsylvania case law instructor, Dan, a.k.a. Daniel Foster, a.k.a. Danny, which me and his grandmother are the only person who call him Danny. <laughs> yeah, indeed. What's going on? So in the natural state of case law instruction, we're going to talk about case law. And what were we talking about today regarding case law? Uh, I was talking about like permissible length of detentions on traffic stops, search incident to arrest, transporting is essentially a de facto arrest, kind of all inter um, related topics, stuff that I know sounds like we're probably beating a dead horse because it seems like these things continue to come up. So I figured maybe, um, you know, offer my perspective on it and come at it with a little bit uh, different angle and maybe provide some value to people. Let's start with, I was writing this stuff down as you were saying, let's start with US v. Sharp, 1985, permissible lengths. This is the controlling US Supreme Court decision that is controlling in a, what we consider or what we're calling a lawful investigative detention. According to the law, a lawful investigative detention. And I'm gonna let you take it away from here. Just so everybody knows, I did no preparation. This is completely off the top of my head but I'm very familiar with the United States to be sharp in its application throughout the entire United States. So why don't yes. you try to give us a little, uh, let's have a good discussion about that. People are super confused. They think often I'll hear like happened yesterday. I taught in West Virginia and I'm trying to make the guy who was in class feel bad. We talked about length of detention. You're waiting for a canine unit was the example. And I said, how long can you hold somebody? And as I was answering the question of this certain specific number, we get to that a lot of States, uh, will concede is about that roundabout area where you have to start to really think about what you're going to do from this point forward. He said 15, 20 minutes. And I went, that's exactly what we're here to do is to dispel that complete bullshit that people think because your sergeant, lieutenant, captain, coworker, whoever it may be, thinks that's the rules. And like I say all the time, show me where it says that because I can show you where it says differently. Yeah, so for sure. Go ahead, Dan. Unpack U.S. v. Sharp, 1985, the United States Supreme Court decision on lawful investigative detentions. And this isn't just for, just to paint a clear picture, this isn't just for waiting for a canine. It's an investigative detention for maybe waiting for a detective to respond, maybe waiting for some specialized unit to respond. Maybe will you let other police officers go out and do their work in an expeditious manner. You can detain somebody if they are the suspect of a crime. But go ahead. Yeah, so Sharp, it's a case, uh, obviously, like you said, a U.S. Supreme Court case from 1985. It actually originated, I believe, out of North Carolina back in 78 or 79 is when the actual case took place. It involved the federal agency, I think it was the DEA or something that conducted a traffic stop on a couple of vehicles there in North Carolina for investigative purposes. Ultimately, the stops ended up lasting about 20 minutes. And it wound up going all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court because they felt that a 20-minute detention was unreasonable, was going to be too long for what would be considered an investigative detention. So the U.S. Supreme Court in 1985 came back down and said, absolutely not. You know, 20 minutes is definitely not going to be the benchmark. 
And actually, we're not going to set a benchmark. They declined to set a bright line rule for what a permissible length of detention would be. And I think their quote was that um, common sense and ordinary human experience must govern over rigid criteria when determining what would be a proper length of an investigative detention, you know, dealing with a vehicle stop or, or really any investigative detention for that matter. So I think that's kind of important to look at um, common sense is going to really um, kind of win the day here. So, you know, as we kind of get a little bit further into the weeds, you know, one of the biggest things you can look at is always ask yourself, hey, does this make sense that I'm holding this person here for X amount of time? Do I have, you know, some solid reasonable suspicion to justify 20, 40, 60, 80, you know, 100 minute detentions? And I know you've talked about it before. There's cases out there that even upwards of two hours or even more that you can hold somebody for and not just waiting on a canine, but conducting your investigation in general. And with Sharp, I think it's important to even go back, you know, a couple of years prior in 1983, U.S. Supreme Court decided uh, Florida v. Royer and investigative detention must last no longer than is reasonable to confirm or dispel your investigative notions and the least intrusive means necessary to meet that end. So I think those two kind of play together a little bit, but as long as you are taking those least intrusive means and you are lasting, that detention is lasting no longer than is reasonable, I, I think you're good for quite a good bit of time, you know, under that common sense criteria under Sharp. The reason Royer, and a lot of people haven't read Florida v. Royer, it's a good case. I actually talk about it in my class. We speak about it in class for the dog hit essentially, and the suggestion they had there. So let me go to Royer just a little bit off the top of my head. Royer was a 90-minute detention, but what they where they failed, it wasn't the 90-minute time limit. It was they did not proceed with the least intrusive means necessary in the fastest way possible. So they said in Royer, the court will look at whether or not the police diligently pursue their investigation and whether the detention lasts no longer than is necessary to effectuate the purpose of the stop. And to go into Royer and give you guys an example of what they said in Royer, essentially a nutshell version is narcotics agents, the Miami-Dade International Airport, stopped this person they believe based on specific and articulable facts that they are a narcotic transporter. Uh, they stop him and, and want to speak with him about getting consent to search his luggage. What essentially happens is they held him too long. Why? because there were other means available to confirm or dispel their suspicions of criminal activity, and they didn't use those means. So actually in the brief, the court's opinion of Florida v. Royer in 1983, this is the suggestion they made. And this is where we go into another topic that we're not going to discuss today because I have to bring a lot of stuff up and bring a lot of stuff out to explain it. But this actually talks about if a canine alert had alerted to this luggage, it would have satisfied the probable cause required to make an arrest and search incident to arrest to include the luggage there. This is the language. Third, the state has not touched on the question whether it would have been feasible to investigate the contents of Royer's bags in a more expeditious way. The courts are not strangers to the use of trained dogs to detect the presence of controlled dangerous substance in luggage. There is no indication here that this means was not feasible and available. If it had been used, Royer's luggage could have been momentarily detained while the investigative procedure was carried out. Indeed, <laughs> it may be that no detention at all would have been necessary. A negative result would have freed Royer in a short order, a positive result would have resulted in his justifiable arrest on probable cause. So Roy is a good one to bring up. There's a lot of really good stuff in Roy. They said a lot of great things for us to know as law enforcement. And there's a lot of people listening to this who may be hearing for the first time that, yeah, there are circumstances that a canine unit could establish probable cause uh, to arrest based on just an alert to the presence of narcotics. And essentially, from what I can gather, typically you'd need other factors to be considered. And the reason I say that is because we do have something called free air sniff under Illinois v. Cabayas, which is a 2005 U.S. Supreme Court case, which is another important one to read, uh, cited quite a bit in U.S. v. Rodriguez, which is another important one to read as well. So no rigid time limits was the theme here. So if you're being told you got 20 minutes, you got 25 minutes, it's the diligent pursuit, least intrusive means necessary. And Dan, I don't know if you want me to give an example of what that may look like, how to prove diligent pursuit, or you want to take the reins on that. Some to you. No, you, no, you could go ahead. I know you talk about it. Usually give an example in class. If you want to you know, talk about it, you're probably better versed at that. So, you know, essentially you're on a stop. You've built enough reasonable suspicion based on previous case law, right? You're, you're like, you're there. 
I have what I need based on what I've read before on stops like this. This is everything that I am required to do to extend this traffic stop based on reasonable suspicion to prolong the detention while waiting for a canine unit to respond. So I make a few phone calls. So here's the first phone call I make is somebody I know who's working. And I call it Dan Foster. Dan Foster's a canine handler with a dog that sniffs for the presence of narcotics. I call Dan Foster and I say, hi, Dan. Uh, it's Dennis. How are you? Are you working? Dan says, I am. Well, Dan, how, where are you at? You know, how far away are you? Dan says, well, I'm 45 minutes away. I'm going to say, well, Dan, I have this car and this traffic stop here. Please start heading my way if you're available. And you say, sure thing. I'll be there in 45 minutes. Now, to prove diligent pursuit, depending on what you have, but if you're in a more populated area, I would probably try to find, to the best of my ability, a dog that's closer. So I may make three or four or five phone calls to different agencies while waiting for Dan to respond. So I'll call the local sheriff's office, the state police. Um, you know, this is another reason why I tell people kind of off the topic, make sure you have a canine unit available or know where to find one. Because when you're going to need one, I don't care who you are, it's going to be a real pain in the ass, especially since we are on some kind of time curve. Uh, we are on some kind of time criteria here. You know, don't wait till you need to find a dog to know where to find a dog. But anyway, I call a few different agencies. I'm speaking openly and loudly on my body-worn camera or my MVR and saying, hi, this is Officer Benino. Do you guys have a canine unit working? No? Okay. I'll make five, six, seven phone calls trying to find a closer dog. But by that time, Dan Foster arrives. I've showed diligent pursuit. I've tried to find a closer dog. My closest dog was 45 minutes later. I'm going to dictate and document this in my report. And essentially what this does, it removes the defense from having a strategy to try to challenge your diligent pursuit. Now, let's say, let's change it up a little bit. I call another agency while I'm waiting for Dan to respond for 45 minutes. And they say, yeah, our canine officer is working. He's about 15 minutes away from your location. Do you want a cell phone number? Yeah, sure. I'd love it. They give me that gentleman's cell phone number or that woman's cell phone number. And I give him a call. We'll call it a female canine handler. There's a lot of them in the country. <laughs> hey, ma'am, how are you? This is Officer Benino. How are you? Yeah, and we get this car stopped out here. Are you working? Are you available to come over to my stop? And then she says, sure. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Now, typically, I'm not going to just call Dan and cancel him because, God forbid, she gets called off to a hot job, a track, a bite. We want, we still want that dog coming. But once she arrives and we're ready to do the sniff and she's 30 minutes ahead of Dan Foster, I can then cancel Dan Foster, use her. And boy, there is no better way to show that this was diligent pursuit. This cop did a phenomenal job of diligent pursuit of this investigation. He went above and beyond. Mr. Benino did a great job of looking for a closer dog. The detainment lasted no longer than was necessary. As a matter of fact, he seemed to cut off 30 minutes from that traffic stop. So it's a great way to, in this scenario, understand what diligent pursuit means. And sometimes diligent pursuit is still pursuit. Now, Dan brought up you know, the fact that there are cases that go beyond, and he mentioned it already, the two-hour time limit. Typically, we see a lot of courts that two-hour time limit is where we're getting into an area where we would need to be able to make a determination is or based on do we have probable cause at this point to continue with this detention to solidify an arrest? That's where decisions have to start getting made. It's a two-hour time limit. For example, Delaware in their legislation says you have two hours and that's it. They actually have a rigid timeline, which I don't agree with. I like the two-hour thing. I like the fact that you're actually saying we have two hours. New Jersey says we have two hours, but New Jersey also says it's not to say that a stop over two hours could never be feasible, but the cops would just have to explain why it was over two hours. Real quick, Nevada does, in legislation now, one hour. You can't go over an hour now in Nevada because they did some knee-jerk reaction during the previous few years in the history of law enforcement in the country and you know one one cop made headline news and then everybody got punished for it so the state of nevada decided to punish the police and in turn what happens is bad guys get away with things more victims are created and the police are subject to having their hands tied to enforce the law uh, albeit professionally no question about it so there are some reveals there hopefully that helps some people but i know dan you have something to say go yeah i was gonna say um you brought up different states so obviously i want to hit on pennsylvania and we pretty much follow sharp um, we've cited sharp in a lot of different cases out of our superior and our supreme court in terms of the reasonableness for the length of detention there is no bright line rule 
We do have one case out of Pennsylvania Commonwealth v. Freeman. Um, I believe that case is from 2016, where it was a 75-minute detention. Part of that time was waiting for a canine. The court held that that 75 minutes was certainly reasonable because the police diligently pursued the agenda of getting that canine there, taking the least intrusive means necessary to um, you know, confirm or dispel their suspicion. And there's some great language in that case that I think kind of, you know, might help a lot of people out. Um, I don't remember the exact verbiage, but to kind of paraphrase a little bit, the court said, we can't hold it against the police for the fact that it simply took longer to dispatch a canine to a rural area than it might in, you know, say a city. We understand that cops work in different parts of the country, different parts of the state, and that sometimes it simply just takes longer to get a canine there. So we can't provide you know, a bright line time limit for one area of the state that might not be feasible in another area of the state. Because if anyone is familiar with Pennsylvania, we have you know Philadelphia on the east, Pittsburgh on the west, and Kentucky in the middle. So a whole lot of, <laughs> yeah, you know, so a uh, whole lot of rural areas here, and maybe not even necessarily rural areas, but areas with smaller departments and maybe not the availability of a canine. But in Freeman, they said, hey, 75 minutes, you know, over an hour that we're, we're good to wait for a canine there. And if people would like to see if their state has similar cases, you could probably go into Google Scholar, which is probably the easiest freeway, scholar.google.com, and search United States v. Sharp 1985, and then you're going to search it against your state and see if, because if, if there was a prolonged detention, they would have to cite U.S. v. Sharp. If you didn't find anything in there under U.S. v. Sharp because you have to cite it perfectly, that's what makes case text a little bit better, uh, you would be able to go in and probably toy around with some key language like investigative detention, time limits, canine weight, things like that would reveal other cases too. Now you might be spinning your wheels. You might be saying, well, I live in this state. Uh, there's not a lot of case law. I've looked into it. There's nothing here. Well, yeah, because it hasn't been challenged. So if you don't have, it's funny, I forgot what state I was in, but cops like at this state were doing no police work. So they're like, we don't have a lot of case law. I'm like, yeah, it leads me to believe that nobody's doing actually proactive police work. They're very reactionary, very old school state. And it's not being challenged because nobody's doing it. So don't forget, case law is born when something occurs. A disposition is given at a superior court level, usually a county court typically, and then it's appealed into an appellate division or a higher court, and there's a decision given, and it's a binding decision, and that's the case law that we use. So if you can't find it in your state, typically, if there's not existing case law in your state, your state, if faced with this issue, will often look at what other states said and make their decisions based on other opinions from other states. So- you can look, you could look at other states. It can be persuasive and kind of get an idea of what the feel is nationally for the decision or the, the, the issue, a topic for what you're, you're discussing. We going to the next one, transporting. A, we want to do transporting against your will. All right. So another thing, you know, kind of just hitting on some of uh, those bigger topics that always seem to come up is transporting somebody essentially against their will, transporting um, absent the ability to arrest somebody. And in fact, transporting somebody against their will is what the court has called a de facto arrest, meaning you certainly need to have probable cause to put somebody in the back of a police car and take them somewhere else, whether it be back to the station or you know another location in terms of your investigation. Um, but anytime you transport somebody against their will, it is essentially an arrest and would require probable cause. So that is something that comes up um, frequently. I used to talk about it at length in class, but it is one of those things that while it's a fairly simple topic, there seems to be a lot of discussion surrounding it. And we tended to kind of get off the rails a little bit in class and spend a lot of time on it. So I actually took it out of my program. Um, you know, certainly anytime it ever comes up, I, I will be happy to answer questions, but I think it's something that, um, you know, it's important to discuss here. So Let's maybe help paint a narrative of where you'd find yourself in a situation like this. And I think people get really confused on when they can do this, when they can't. Now, first of all, the one thing I want to say is, remember, the key words are against somebody's will. If somebody's volunteering to be transported somewhere, well, certainly that's not a problem at all. But hence, this is typically why a lot of guidelines and policies say, bring the victim to the offender. 
right? The offender is detained lawfully. Typically, the victim is voluntary. There are some exceptions. Uh, when you read your case, you'll understand this, where the subject or the target or the suspect can be brought to the victim and you wouldn't need judicial authorization. You would just have to know what the case law said. And typically it's because there is some kind of inhabiting nature of the injuries sustained by the victim. A reason why the victim can't get to the offender. So we could bring the offender to the victim. You know, maybe it was a, a really significant assault and they're getting, they're being tended to medically. And we have an expeditious time. We still have to follow the time limit of investigative detention. So we've got to make that call of let's put this guy in the back seat of the car. And the reason they don't want you doing that, there's a lot of science behind like they already look like they're guilty because they're in the back of a car, you're handcuffing somebody. It's a far more intrusive procedure, but albeit permitted under certain circumstances. What are those circumstances? Well, typically the ones I just described, but you guys would have to read case law. People ask me questions then in class and I go, you know, guys, I'm glad to answer these questions, but the more you read case law, the less questions you will have. They are answered for you already. And I mean, I have 150 pending messages now. Case law question, case law question. Guys, you're really going to have to start. I, I just, I'll never get to them all. We'll try to answer them in forums like this, but you'll have to take it some initiative on your own to start reading some of this stuff. And they are, there are books that make it very simple to read. So that's the first thing I'm going to say. Do you want to go on that topic there? I have more stuff about this. I want to talk about uh, Dunaway v. New York. I think that's kind of the landmark case that kind of started all this discussion for transporting against your will. And that's a 1979 U.S. Supreme Court case out of, I believe, Rochester, New York. There was um, a robbery and a homicide at a pizza shop up there in Rochester. The police develop a suspect, Mr. Dunaway, and they essentially um, go and what would be considered arrest him, apprehend him to bring him back for questioning absent probable cause. And the it went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court said, um, absolutely, that was an arrest when you took him from one place, transported him back to the police station um, without his consent, against his will. You essentially did arrest him, requiring probable cause. And ultimately, I believe in Dunaway, um, he had confessed to that crime and they threw out the confession as well as being tainted, even though they had given him Miranda, the Miranda was not enough to cure the taint of that unlawful transport. So even down the line, we get the fruits of the poisonous tree doctrine and, you know, we can end up losing confessions, losing any evidence we recover. Um, if we conducted, you know, a quote unquote search incident to arrest prior to that transport, certainly we're going to lose anything that we had recovered from that search as well. When we don't have probable cause to transport somebody, um, you know, back to the station. I often say that the lack of knowledge by police officers in the field is really detrimental to the victims of the crimes because sure. police officers who don't know what they're talking about or don't know what they're doing and think they're doing a good job because they saw it on the first 48 or maybe cops or live PD. That's where they're getting the training from. They will get things suppressed. And another case, it's interesting because I say to people, you know, new case law that comes out that's bad typically rests on not knowing existing case law. It's not like they've changed anything <laughs> That we've already we haven't already said. And when you say Don Wave in New York, I go right to Calp versus Texas. Mm -hmm. So in Calp versus Texas, you know, essentially there is a, I believe, a rape and a homicide of a young girl. And they go to this guy's house minus probable cause. And one of these suspects, I think he was the accomplice in stashing the body. Uh, I think it was the cousins, maybe the cousin or the brother of the of the actual main suspect. And they wake her up at three o'clock in the morning and transport him involuntarily back down to police headquarters for an interview in his underwear and no shirt on, right? I remember. Yes. And we know this is like your typical prison uh, boxers. Like, you know, you're like, or county jail <laughs> boxers, right? You go, to a, you go to a job and the guy comes out and he's wearing literally everything they give you at the county jail. <laughs> so those are white boxers. If you've never seen a plain white boxers, that's typically what you see. Uh, you pull up to a job and you see that and you go, oh, this guy's been in the county jail. Those are his underwear from the county. You know, essentially the same thing occurred is that confession was thrown out. The U.S. Supreme Court could not save it because they had violated the law. <laughs> And it wasn't intentional. It's just a bad job on their behalf. And we see these things over and over again. It's like, it's just a bad job. It comes down to the fact that police need to know case law and nobody is, nobody's even looking at it. We get constantly these things tossed and thrown out. There's a case that came out in New Jersey. I'm going to do a video on it and probably a podcast episode on it. And people got so confused. They don't even know what they're talking about. They, what they said about the case, a lot of people completely misunderstood it. So much so that a county in New Jersey actually changed their position on a certain thing. And yeah. somebody brought it up to me. I'm like, but that doesn't make any sense. That's not what that case said. 
but they could not understand it. Somebody did not get was reading this case law and completely misunderstood it. And the worst thing is this county has the position to do whatever they want because they're the lead law enforcement agency in the in the county. And they can tell whatever they want them to do to do. Um, and it's ridiculous. It's absolutely completely a moot gesture. Um, actually, I don't even like the road it goes down because it's now setting kind of a, a feel of precedent of a of a technique that's completely unnecessary. And nobody else in the state is following. So it's just wild, the misconception of case law and how people don't understand it. And if you don't or you don't get it, don't raise your hand and say, I know what the answer is. If you don't, like, just ask us. We'll try to help help you understand what they were getting at. There's not a lot of people, and I'm not trying to toot our horn, who really understand it. Even some of your professionals in the field who you think really get it actually don't really get it. So, you know, Cal versus Texas, another one. There's actually, I think, what's the other one? Is it Florida v. Hayes? Uh, Hayes v. Florida, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, dealt with transporting somebody for fingerprinting, maybe, if I remember correctly. I don't think I don't... that was it. I, I I think it was along the same lines. Again, I, well, I haven't done any preparation for this, but yeah, Florida v. Yeah. Hayes is another one, or Hayes v. Florida, whatever you want to call it. Another U.S. Supreme Court decision where they had to come back around for the third time and talk about, hey, we said this 40 years ago. What did and you guys miss that... about this? Yeah, and Cal v. Texas, if I'm not mistaken, was a 2002, 2003 case. Um, you know, Dunaway was from 79. So like 23, 24 years later, they're rehashing the same argument because apparently the cops in Cal v. Texas hadn't read Dunaway v. New York because it's well, essentially it. very similar facts. Dude, it's crazy. Like I read case law a lot of places. There are cops who are completely disregarding the principles of Miranda, but Let's talk about the biggest elephant in the room. Terry V. Ohio comes out in, what, 1968? And they tell you, in order to be able to frisk somebody, you would either need a reasonable suspicion that somebody's armed and dangerous. This is minus a probable cause to arrest them and search them incident to arrest. Uh, you would need some kind of specific and articulable facts. And a lot of states have said, look, you don't got to be completely sure. You just have to point to some reason why you're allowed to frisk somebody or get consent to frisk. Typically, you're also allowed to get consent to frisk. Some agencies or some states have departed from that, but not many. Yet cops still go out and do routine pat frisks. And literally every case law that you read in every state is, you cannot do routine pat frisks. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's not allowed. I know you saw it on live PD. That is not how we do things here. Now, I don't want to dissuade people from doing pat frisks because they're afraid that they, they're going to violate the law in, in that sense. I think what a lot of times cops are doing is they're just not doing a good job of specifically articulating why they did the path for us. They're just doing it and in their mind saying, look, I knew something was wrong here. Yeah, just they know. It. Yeah, sure. they know. Like, we're not frisking everybody, right? So just just right. articulate. But there's no such thing as routine procedures. I had a guy yesterday send me an email or a DM on Instagram. And he's like citing something. He's like, no, we're allowed to do that here. I'm like, no, you're not. Like, you can't fucking do that. Like, you, yeah. there's no such thing as routine procedures. No, if they're lawfully detained, they go, that's the first prong of Terry. Of Terry, right. So- Wild stuff. Now let's let's continue on with this transporting against people's wills. We've now already talked about if it's a voluntary transport, it makes it legal and constitutional. Sure. Maybe I'll set some scenarios up here. Typically, a lot of police officers think that in a motor vehicle setting, when somebody is providing false information in response to their subjectivity of being issued a summons. This just happened in West Virginia yesterday. These guys are like, we well, didn't think we could do anything. I'm like, it's wild to me that you work as a police officer will be handed false information when somebody is subject to receiving a motor vehicle summons, albeit for something even as small as we're not wearing a seatbelt. And you know they're lying to you and you don't do anything about it. Now, this is a part where there's laws that specifically explain what you're allowed to do. So we're in a probable cause situation. So when we say, transporting against their will, we're not talking about this scenario where we're like, well, we're transporting against their will. We can't do that. No, no, no. You have PC for arrest. It's a yeah. different thing. You have to understand the difference between the two. And people get a big confusion on it. This is not even discussed in the academy. People don't know what to do when they're faced with these circumstances. It's not, it's not discussed. And there's a, it's not that it's a tricky game to play. It's just know what your knowledge is, know what your power allows you to do. And you know the ones given to you and granted by the Constitution and follow the Constitution. Don't get confused in what we're saying here. You have to understand the difference between when you have probable cause to arrest versus prob or sorry, versus reasonable suspicion to detain. Sure. So go ahead and comment on that. And I have one more thing on this topic. 
Yes. So I think one of the kind of just to give a scenario where this might even come up, where this would be um, applicable to talk about would be, and this is Pennsylvania specific because I know that other states and other um, you know places throughout the country have different things that a canine alert might provide, whether it's probable cause to arrest or, or whatever. So say in Pennsylvania, canine alerts on a vehicle, on a traffic stop, you now have probable cause to search that car. Obviously in Pennsylvania, everybody knows we lost the vehicle exception to the warrant requirement. So we're gonna either need to get a warrant or consent or some other justification for that search. But nonetheless, canine alerts on the car, we now have probable cause to search the car. In Pennsylvania, that does not automatically give us probable cause to arrest the occupants of that vehicle. What if we wanna take that car back? Say we do get a warrant. We wanna take that car back to the garage and search that car. Can we now, with only that information, transport those occupants of that vehicle back to the police station along with the car? And certainly the answer would be no, if it's against their will. Um, that would be a de facto arrest. We could get them to consent to come back. Hey, you know, we're gonna search your car back at the station. Um, might take us a little bit. You guys wanna come hang out in the lobby. That way, you know, we can get you on your way here quickly or, or what do you wanna do? That would certainly be fine if they consent to that transport, but simply because we got a canine alert on the car, we now can search the car. Doesn't mean we can make an arrest on them or a de facto arrest by transporting them. So just kind of an example of one time that I think that might come up off the top of my head there. So New Jersey actually has case law established where if you do have a can alert, uh, especially based on circumstances that you can make an arrest on right. the alert alone, impound right. the vehicle, take the occupants back to police headquarters under arrest and then proceed to search the vehicle. Um, sure, which yeah. is why I say that obviously it's state specific. I, I can't speak for other states. I don't want people to get confused there. I know there's a lot more leeway in a lot of other states, certainly, than Pennsylvania has, especially recently. Maryland actually specifically states, and it's controlling, that we don't arrest for canine alerts in the state of Maryland. That's not how it works. Sure. And of course, sure. I'm not surprised. It's a pretty anti-police feeling state. I'm not saying they don't get respect in some, sorts of this, uh, some parts of the state. But overall, the legislation, the court system in Maryland is not police friendly by any stretch of the imagination. They are yeah. depart from the Fourth Amendment on a lot of topics. When you say de facto arrest, I just want to explain to people what that means. It's an unintentional arrest, and it wasn't intended to be an arrest, but based on the circumstances surrounding the incident, the confinement, the language that's used by police, a lot of circumstances actually make it in the eyes of the law, if we're looking at it from an analyzation factor, an actual arrest. It constituted an arrest. and You'd have to have probable cause to support it. I know this stuff's getting a little confusing at this point. I have one more thing to talk about on this topic, but go ahead. Yeah, so well, I thought of another example that I think might help because I get a lot of questions on this is DUI stops, field sobriety tests. When we stop somebody for um, you know investigating a DUI or OWI or whatever it's called in other states, can we transport them back to the station or to another location to conduct field sobriety tests absent already having established probable cause to arrest? And again, the answer to that is going to be no. We can't take people against their will. Again, consent, sell it to them. Hey, the weather's bad out here. I want to give you a fair shake at doing these tests. Do you want to come back to the station where we can be in a controlled environment inside, good lighting, good floors, you know, to conduct these tests? If they say, yeah, absolutely, you can do that. But you can't simply just throw somebody in a car and take them somewhere else, or at least not a significant distance, um, because it's going to create a de facto arrest. One way to justify putting somebody in a car and transporting them against their will without having the authority at that point to arrest would be much like a lot of other things would be exigent circumstances. Um, if you have exigent circumstances to, hey, I got to hurry up and move this person for whatever reason, um, for some type of emergency situation, exigent circumstances could justify a short duration transportation in a police car without having already established probable cause to arrest. And we do actually have a case on that out of PA. It is Commonwealth v. Revere, um, like Paul Revere, R-E-V-E-R-E, -E -E, from the PA Supreme Court back in 2005. Like a lot of um, you know cases that come out of Pennsylvania, that one originated in Philadelphia. It started with, um, I believe it was three or four cops. They were investigating some open air drug transactions on the street in Philadelphia, some hand-to-hand -hand transactions. There have been some gun crimes. 
um, just kind of a bad area of the city. They're out there on, I'm assuming, like some type of impact detail, jumping out on people. So they jump out on these three people who they deemed to be suspicious. They had developed, you know, reasonable suspicion to detain them. Immediately, um, one or two of the guys flees. They are able to uh, continue their detention on the other one or two people they had originally jumped out on. A couple female officers set out on foot and uh, tried to apprehend the two guys that had fleed. Um, moments later, the other officers who were back at the original location hear these female officers screaming, you know, top of their lungs. They believe that a fight has ensued, that something bad has happened, that these cops are getting hurt. So they take the people that they had detained at the scene there, threw them in the back of the police car and drove to investigate to lend aid to the female officers. Ultimately, it was determined that they were just yelling, hey, stop, freeze, police, whatever, that they were not in any danger at that point. They went, they transported them back to the original location, went back to a normal investigative detention. And the court in Revere held that that transport was justified by exigent circumstances because they were fearful for the safety of those female police officers. And they upheld that uh, that ongoing detention at that point based on those exigent circumstances. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Obviously, that scenario, a little bit outlandish, probably not going to happen too often. But you do have exigent circumstances, potentially you could fall back on, you know, to kind of not get around, but to justify uh, potentially transporting at least a short distance, maybe not back to the station, but without probable cause. Yeah, I would even think that I think I've read case law and I again, I'm not a DWI expert that I would certainly believe and I could be wrong on this, that you would be able to move somebody 20 feet off the roadway, yeah. 50 feet off the roadway into a parking lot to conduct field sobriety off the highway. To conduct and that's field why, sobriety testing. Yeah, that's why I didn't want to get ahead of myself. I, I thought it was important to bring up a short distance. We're not talking transporting back to the station. We're not talking driving them seven miles, you know, against their will. If we want to move somebody a few feet, hey, there's an overhang over there. We're going to go over here. Certainly, we have the authority to, you know, control their movement at that point and direct them to a safer location that's a short distance away. One more scenario I want to talk about is if you work in a state that's not a right to identify state. <laughs> And let's just make this very clear again for the hundredth time. When you work in a state that's a right to identify state, first of all, this means that there is a piece of legislation, a law on the record, on the books in your state that says, if the police are in a position to order you to identify yourself, which means an offense has occurred and you are the suspect believed to have committed that offense, you have to comply with it. You must reveal your information. You must tell them who you are. If you fail to do so, you will get arrested. Here's the charge they can use. A lot of cops in states that are not right to identify states think, well, there's nothing I can do. You're missing the point here. You just don't have a statute to charge them with. It doesn't mean you can't do anything. So the question is, what do I do at this point? Well, if you're in New Jersey, we have something called an investigative detention order. So you can do something, but you'll need to call a judge first because they can do a lot more than you can do. So an investigative detention order is something that you can find in New Jersey. Probably 96% of the cops here have never even heard of it. And the only reason why the other 4% have heard of it is because I've probably said it in class and explained it, and they went back and told other people. But essentially, if you're in a situation where you have somebody who uh, the circumstances are falling short of probable cause, but you really believe this is the guy that committed this offense, and it's going to take a while to figure out if this is actually him, but you really have a strong suspicion based on specific <clears throat> and articulable facts that this is the person that committed it. But he is saying he's not moving, he's not walking away, right? You're moving, you're walking away. Now we have an obstruction by flight. We may have a resisting arrest. Maybe in some other states, it's called interference. It could be a lot of different state statutes that apply to that. But now we have a guy who merely stands there and says, I'm not telling you who I am. You're doing everything you can to try to figure out who he is, absent you know, taking his fingerprints. So you call a judge and you say, Your Honor, we have a crime that occurred. We have These are the facts that lead us to believe this gentleman out here is the person of interest. Here's why. We would like to get an investigative detention order to transport him back to police headquarters and obtain his fingerprints and go through procedures uh, required to do so. Now, once that order is filled out, I've seen them, boys and girls, like I've had them. Once that order is filled out, we can go back to this gentleman and say, we now have a judicial order to move you, to transport you for identification purposes. The big delta here, the Mendoza line between it being legal and illegal, is a judicial authorization. Once we go to a judge with this, now we can do something. So you got to have a you got to have a plan in place. You got to let your prosecutors know. And say, look, we know these things exist. If we run into this scenario, know we're going to call you. What's our game plan for that? We want to not wait till then to try to explain this to them. 
And now we can say to this gentleman, hey, uh, we have a judicial order. If you fail to comply with it, you will be placed under arrest formally for contempt of court. In New Jersey, that's what it would be. You're going to be in contempt of court. It's a judicial order. And then we're going to arrest you and charge you with such. Um, this is used for other scenarios as well. If we're trying to get a DNA sample from somebody and we have a crime that occurred and we have specific and articulable facts to believe this person committed that crime and we collected DNA from that crime scene and we say to the judge, your honor, look, we had this crime that occurred. Let's say it was a burglary, but the guy cut his wrist and there's blood at the scene. We collected the CODIS and we say to the judge, we have other factors showing this is probably him. Here's why. We have reasonable suspicion. If we actually just get his sample, there's a real likelihood that we will solve this crime and bring him to justice. This happens all the time. And a judge can say, okay, based on what you have, crime occurred. You actually have reasonable suspicion to believe that this person committed the crime. You can go and force him. Here's an investigative detention order. You can detain him and force this gentleman or her, or whatever it may be, to provide a sample to the courts of their DNA. And that's legitimate. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of these things used. We had uh, one of our uh, guys who associated with this, Rick Bachman um, at a Linden. They used it one time for a homicide suspect. The guy had a specific gait. They were led to believe this is the guy who did it when he walked. So they had him on video walking out of the homicide scene with a very unique way he walked. It was a specific gait. They got it, investigative detention order, and brought him in and made him walk back and forth in a gymnasium uh, multiple times. If he failed to do so, he'd be confined to the county jail until he complied to do such. And that's the power of the judicial uh, you know, court system. And that was actually a major factor in his conviction for the homicide. That was a significant piece, and the judge understood that. So when a judge understands what it is, you can employ something like this. Now, I know you're saying, well, we don't know if we have investigative detention orders in our state. That's okay. Contact a judge, and I've been told they can put this on a warrant. And a warrant that resembles what we typically look at as an investigative detention order. So this is a, it's a great tool to use and to know, and hopefully you guys – we just want you to do it the right way. You know, don't we got you got to get this job done, right? We got to do it the right way. Look at this stuff. It's really cool. Awesome. And yeah, that's uh, PA probably be a warrant. I know like DNA you brought up. I've written a few for um, compelling somebody to give a buckle swab and you know DNA samples. So, yeah, I'm not to the best of my knowledge, unless it's somewhere in the judicial code that I've never read, but we don't have like that typical judicial authorization order, it would just go on a search warrant at that point. There's a lot to know about the law. There's no question about it. And the more you know about it, the more comfortable you are and the more people actually find you to be valuable to them. Yeah. Um, and I, I've actually argued that if you know more case law, you typically in an environment where people are promoted on nepotism can actually beat that based on meritocracy because of the value that you possess, you're a linchpin. They can't work without you. They need you here. They can't lose you. So just some food for thought with that. Dan, I think we've covered enough today. We'll save some for the next time we do this. Absolutely. Been going for quite a while now. And, uh, you know, I care about you tremendously and I can't wait to hug you when I see you. Likewise. You look great, by the way. You should um, come out with like a street cop line of skin moisturizer. I think it would sell well if you could be the spokesperson. Maybe I could just sponsor the kind of moisturizer that I use every morning and every night. Do you want to tell everybody what that is? Because I'm sure there's a lot of eager listeners out there that are dying. Yeah, so to I use a, I use a, I use Brickle charcoal face face scrub at night, and then I uh, typically moisturize with a Cetaphil or Cetaphil, however you say it. Fair enough. On that note, hey, it was great talking to you. Likewise. <laughs> if you guys want to find Dan's classes, check out treecop.com, Pennsylvania case law. He has a, two versions of it. Uh, we don't call them one and two because they're they're interchangeable. You don't have to take any in particular order. One has to do with certain topics. The other one has to do with another group of topics. And he is very good. And people leave that training program extremely satisfied and really happy. So Dan's been with us for a long time. And we're so pumped to continue on this process together. And maybe the next time we could talk about your conversation with Marcus Luttrell and that story. That's a fun one. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Let's mark that one down. So Dan, Dan has a good story about Marcus Luttrell from our last conference. And it's really cool. So awesome. All right, brother. I'll see you. All right. See you. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then 
You could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum, going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.